Section 13 of Louis Pasteur by Albert Keim and Louis Lumet, translated by Frederick Tabor Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 9 The Pasteur Institute. After the close of the War of 1870, Pasteur wrote to Emile Duclos, expressing his great desire to gather all his pupils into one establishment of which he should be the master, and where they could work together for science and the cure of disease in accordance with his system and fertile methods. More than twenty years were destined to pass before he saw the realization of this wish that was so dear to him and he was not only infirm but almost helpless when he entered the building that was to bear his name. Thanks to the movement of universal enthusiasm aroused by his cure for hydrophobia, an international subscription was opened upon the initiative of the Academy of Sciences for the purpose of founding an establishment for vaccination and for scientific studies under the title of the Pasteur Institute. Within a few months, the modest mites of the poor and the banknotes of the rich and generous formed a sum amounting to 2,586,680 francs, approximately $517,336, and the institute buildings, slowly constructed, were inaugurated by the President of the Republic, Sadi Carnot, on the 14th of November, 1888. The ceremony took place in the library hall before a gathering, including delegations from learned societies, cabinet ministers, members of the committee of the Institute, presided over by Joseph Bertrand, prominent statesmen and former government officials. Dr. Gonchet, treasurer of the committee, who had been one of the first to recognize the value of the method of vaccinating against hydrophobia, celebrated the discoveries of the illustrious scientist now so nearly vanquished in life's struggle you know he said to his eminent hearers that m pasteur is an innovator that his creative imagination controlled by a rigorous observation of facts has overthrown many errors and built up in their place an entirely new science his discoveries relating to ferments to the generation of infinitely small organisms and to microbes as the cause of contagious diseases have constituted in biological chemistry, in the veterinary art and in medicine, not a regular process, but a radical revolution. Now revolutions, even those inspired by scientific demonstrations, leave behind them, wherever they pass, some victims who do not easily forgive. Consequently, M. Pasteur has a number of adversaries scattered throughout the world, not to count those French Athenians who do not like to see the same man always in the right and always fortunate. And as though his adversaries were not already numerous enough, M. Pasteur made himself others by the implacable rigor of his dialectics and the dogmatic form that he sometimes gives to his thoughts. To this discourse of Dr. Granchet, Pasteur replied in lofty and noble words, in which there was a blending of melancholy and pride, and of the deep confidence that he had in the powers of science. And on the day, when foreseeing the future possibilities that would be opened up by the discovery of the virus, so ran the words delivered by his son, for Pasteur himself was too much overcome by suffering and emotion to deliver them in person, I appeal directly to my country to enable us by means of private subscriptions to build laboratories designed not only for the treatment of hydrophobia, but also for the study of virulent and contagious diseases. That same day, France gave to us with lavish hands. And here we see it finished, this grand building of which it may be truly said, that there is not a single stone that is not the material sign of a generous thought. All the virtues have paid tribute toward the erection of this abode of toil. Alas, it is my most poignant sorrow that I enter it as a man already vanquished by age, no longer surrounded by any of my former masters, 
nor any of the companions of my struggles neither dumas nor boulet nor paul bert nor Roupian, who after having been like you my dear granger the counsellor of my early efforts became the most convinced and energetic defender of my method and yet although i grieve to think they are no longer here after having taken part so valiantly in controversies which i never provoked but which i was forced to endure although they cannot hear me proclaim what i owe to their counsels and support although i feel their absence as keenly as on the day after their death i have at least the consolation of the thought that all this work which we defended together is destined not to perish and this faith in our science is shared by the collaborators and disciples here present hold fast to the enthusiasm my dear colleagues which has been yours since the earliest hour but make strict accuracy its inseparable companion assert nothing that cannot be proved in some simple and decisive fashion cultivate the critical spirit taken by itself it is neither an awakener of ideas nor an incentive to great deeds but without it nothing is stable it always has the last word this which i ask of you and which you in turn will ask of the disciples whom you train is the thing which of all others is most difficult for an inventor to believe that you have discovered an important scientific fact to feel a feverish desire to proclaim it and yet to force yourself for days and weeks sometimes for years to combat your own discovery to do your utmost to disprove your own experiments and to refrain from announcing what you have discovered until you have exhausted every contrary hypothesis that indeed is an arduous task but when after all these efforts you arrive at certainty you experience one of the greatest joys that the human soul can know and the thought that you will contribute to the honour of your country renders this joy even more profound even if science has no country the man of science must needs have one and it is to her that he should give the credit for the influence which his labours may have throughout the world if i may be permitted mr president to close with a philosophic reflection brought to my mind by your presence in this hall of toil i would like to say that it seems to me that two contrary laws are to-day at war one a law of blood and death which by daily inventing new methods of combat forces the peoples to be forever ready for the field of battle and the other a law of peace and labour and health which dreams only of delivering mankind from the scourges that beset it the one seeks only violent conquests the other only the assuagement of human ills the latter places a single human life above all victories the former would sacrifice hundreds of thousands of existences to the ambition of one man alone the law of which we are the instruments seeks even in the midst of carnage to stay the bloody havoc wrought by the law of war the bandaging inspired by our antiseptic methods may preserve thousands of soldiers which of these laws will be victorious over the other god alone knows but of this we may be assured that french science will do its utmost in obedience to the law of humanity to extend the frontiers of life what lofty accents and how well they sum up the philosophy of the long and laborious effort which pasteur unfalteringly sustained he had reached his home vanquished by life to use his own expression but it was peopled by active toilers his pupils and disciples who were imbued with his method and would continue to carry on his work one and all obedient to his temperament and genius as a scientist the first buildings erected on the rue du Tau are devoted to the service of the bacteriological institute they cover a surface space of eleven thousand square metres and consist of two vast two-story pavilions parallel to the street and connected by a third midway between them 
they contain besides the laboratories the study halls and a library where scientific works may be consulted and which also contains busts of pasteur of don pedro of alexander the third of madame furtado heine of madame boucicot of m a de rothschild and of the count de lobespin all benefactors of the institute it is also adorned by two paintings the one representing emile duclos the other professor menschnikoff work in this fine and spacious chamber is facilitated by the cordial welcome of its librarian m roussel an apartment has been reserved for pasteur it is at present occupied by dr roux director of the institute all the working rooms whatever their dimensions are finished according to the same model without colours and with varnished walls with the result that there is always the most absolute cleanliness the department for the treatment of hydrophobia is installed on the ground floor it includes a waiting room an examination room an inoculation room besides a laboratory in which are preserved the marrows of infected rabbits which are used for the preparation of vaccines in the left wing are situated a lecture room a laboratory for the preparation of culture mediums and a dissecting room the first floor is given over to the course in the technical study of microbes and the second floor is used for the researches of young scientists who have been admitted for the purpose of carrying on their personal studies the active work of the bacteriological institute is divided into four main branches the department of vaccines the department of hydrophobia the department of technical microbiology and the department of menschnikoff after the erection of the bacteriological institute the serotherapic institute was founded as a result of the discovery by dr roux of the vaccine for croup and next the institute of biological chemistry the pasteur institute as a collective whole which had for its first director the illustrious scientist emile duclos forms a vast organism in which the most precious discoveries are evolved it is frequented by large numbers of students both native and foreign it has thrown forth branches throughout the world and there is to-day no country that does not possess a pasteur institute we find them in russia turkey italy brazil the argentine republic the french colonies tunis indochina morocco cambodia etc every year a new building rises on some corner of the earth where there is some special malady to conquer and whither a remedy may be brought commissions set forth from the institute in the rue du tot to go and study on the spot these great epidemics the modern scourges which must be conquered the pasteur institute to-day directed by dr roux is an incomparable working laboratory in which the most precious discoveries are being evolved and it is also an admirable institute for the promulgation of france's contributions to science End of section thirteen section fourteen of louis pasteur by albert keim and louis lumet translated by frederick tabor cooper this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter ten the supreme homage pasteur was seventy years of age from his earliest years of study he had consecrated his life to science and unwaveringly with tireless energy that neither envious attacks nor bodily illness could break down he had pursued through a chain of strong and harmonious logic the revolution which his genius had introduced into science and medicine now in spite of the last selfish resistance of those who were not willing to surrender to the evidence of the truth his name became famous throughout the world his methods were introduced into numberless laboratories his discoveries were everywhere being applied with success pasteur bowed with suffering and with years almost incapacitated to do further work was surrounded by universal admiration and by the personal affection 
of that group of scientists who within his institute were pursuing their personal researches along the path that he had traced it was at this epoch that various committees were formed both in france and abroad for the purpose of celebrating the seventieth anniversary of his birth the movement emanated from denmark sweden and norway while at paris the academy of sciences was deeply stirred on the seventh of november eighteen ninety two by a letter from its section of medicine and surgery asking that homage should be paid to the illustrious scientist monsieur the president monsieur pasteur will be seventy years of age on the twenty seventh of next december the section of medicine and surgery feels that it ought to take the initiative in celebrating this glorious anniversary yet while medicine and surgery both owe monsieur pasteur a boundless admiration and gratitude we know that the institute as a whole is united in this same sentiment accordingly we propose to invite our colleagues in the institute as well as all others who have benefited from the labors and discoveries of m pasteur either in the domain of scientific research or in the practice of their art to contribute to a subscription raised for the purpose of offering our illustrious compatriot a souvenir and a homage on the occasion of this jubilee to this end the section of medicine and surgery has constituted itself a subscription committee m duclos has kindly consented to cooperate with us and professor granchet has undertaken the duties of secretary of the committee we beg that our colleagues will send their offerings to the office of the secretary of the institute the members of the committee marais charcot brancecart granchet bouchard venoy guillon duclos the academy of sciences hastened to comply with the desire of its section of medicine and at the following meeting pasteur expressed his thanks to his colleagues i was not present he said at the opening of the last meeting when the president read the letter from the section of medicine and surgery someone was kind enough to detain me outside it was well he did so i should have been too deeply moved to return adequate thanks to my colleagues for the excessive honor they are preparing for me even today i am unable to express all the emotion and gratitude that i feel roti a member of the institute was chosen to execute the medal which was to be presented to him and messieurs bouchard and guillon undertook to arrange the details of the jubilee it took place on december twenty seventh eighteen ninety two in the presence of the president of the republic sadi carnot in the great amphitheatre of the new sorbonne seated on the platform were to be seen to the right of the president's chair m d'abadie president of the academy of sciences le royer president of the senate ribot president of the council of ministers the ambassadors from russia england austria hungary belgium portugal the netherlands sweden and norway denmark and bavaria on the left messieurs joseph bertrand permanent secretary of the academy of sciences charles floquet president of the chamber charles dupuy minister of public instruction and all the other ministers behind these official personages were the delegations from the institute the academy of medicine and foreign scientific societies m greillat vice-rector of the academy of paris m perrault director of the ecole normale the deans of the faculties the presidents of the court of cassation of the council of state and of the court of appeals the auditorium was occupied by delegations from the schools and faculties the general association of students the hospital staffs the ecole normale superieure the polytechnique and the faculty of medicine the faculty of sciences and the school of pharmacy it was a chosen assemblage wrought to the highest pitch of enthusiasm and comprising representatives of all that was best in art and science and intellectual thought at half past ten louis pasteur made his entry leaning on the arm of the president of the republic while the band of the republican guard saluted him with a triumphal march and the entire assemblage arose to its feet and acclaimed him with rounds of applause 
pasteur seated himself before a little table on the platform in order to receive the addresses of the delegates and the president of the academy of sciences m d'abadie opened the meeting and gave the floor to m charles dupuy minister of public instruction after summing up the works of pasteur and extending a greeting to the foreign delegates m dupuy concluded by pointing out the significance of the jubilee but what characterizes this ceremony beyond all else what gives your jubilee its distinctive mark he said is that our homage is extended less to the past than to the future science on behalf of which the whole universe is in your debt has received from you a sure method and a definite principle but as you yourself have said the era of its application has only just commenced the Pasteur Institute, built and endowed through the gratitude and admiration of peoples and of governments for the purpose of serving both as a centre of high scientific culture and a source of relief for the ills of the human race, will realise your hopes. May you long continue, dear and illustrious Master, to preside over the destinies of this young and glorious edifice and animate with your inspiring ardor the phalanx of disciples who will surely fulfill the promises of the pasteur doctrine may france possess you for long years yet to come and distinguish you before the world as the worthy object of her love her gratitude and her pride after m d'abadie had presented pasteur with the great golden medal engraved by roti addresses were made by m bertrand and daubray and then by the famous English surgeon Lister, in the name of the Royal Society of London. Monsieur Pasteur, he said, the great honor has been accorded me of bringing you the homage of the sciences of medicine and surgery. As a matter of fact, there is no one living in the entire world to whom the medical sciences owe so much as they do to you. Your researches in regard to fermentations have shed a powerful light that has illumined the fatal darkness of surgery and changed the treatment of wounds from a matter of empiricism uncertain and too often disastrous to a scientific art of assured beneficence thanks to you surgery has undergone a complete revolution which has robbed it of its terrors and extended its efficacious powers almost without limit medicine is indebted no less than surgery to your profound and philosophic studies you have lifted the veil which for centuries had overhung infectious diseases you have discovered and demonstrated their microbic nature thanks to your initiative and in many cases to your special and personal labors there are already a number of these pernicious disorders of the causes of which we have a complete knowledge felix qui patuit rerum conoscere causas this knowledge has already perfected in a surprising fashion the diagnosis of these scourges of the human race and has pointed out the path which must be followed in their prophylactic and curative treatment on this path your fine discoveries of the attenuation and reinforcement of viruses and preventive inoculations serve and will always continue to serve as guiding stars as a brilliant illustration i may refer to your services in regard to hydrophobia their originality is so striking both in respect to pathology and to therapeutics that in the beginning many physicians were mistrustful of you is it possible they said to me that a man who is neither a physician nor a biologist can instruct us after this fashion regarding a disease over which the finest brains in the medical profession have labored in vain quis nois hic nostri succesit sedibus hospes for my part i knew only too well the brilliance of your genius the scrupulous care of your inductions and your absolute honesty to share such opinions for a moment my confidence has been amply justified by the results because with the insignificant exception of a few ignorant persons the whole world now recognizes the greatness of your victory over this terrible malady you have furnished a method of diagnosis which puts an end beyond question to the torturing uncertainty which formerly haunted any one 
who had been bitten by a dog which, although healthy, was suspected of being mad. This alone would have sufficed to assure you the eternal gratitude of humanity. But through your marvellous system of inoculations against hydrophobia, we have succeeded in following up the poison after its entry into the system and have vanquished it. Monsieur Pasteur, infectious diseases constitute, as you know, the great majority of maladies that afflict the human race. You can therefore well understand that the sciences of medicine and surgery are eager, upon this solemn occasion, to offer you the profound homage of their admiration and gratitude. At the close of this address, the two great scientists exchanged affectionate greetings in the midst of tumultuous enthusiasm. Further addresses were delivered by M. Bergeron, permanent secretary of the Academy of Medicine, and by M. Sauton, president of the Municipal Council of Paris. The delegations then filed past the little table behind which Pasteur was seated and laid their addresses on it. England was represented not only by Lister but by Burden Sanderson, Grath, Malloy, Pavi, Percival Wright, Roscoe, Ray Lancaster, Ruffer, Sidney Martin, Woodhead, Plimmer, Germany by Haskovec and Scotelius, Belgium by Berlier, Van Beneden, Casimir, Despères, Herrera, Laurent, Parmentier, Pecher, Rousseau, Rufferat, De Vilde, Denmark by Jacobson, Salomonson, Stuttgart, Vancher, Spain by Chiron, and Henner, Holland by Engelmann, Pekelharing, Sponk, Stockfis, Van Overbeckel de Meyer, Italy by Campana and Perocito, Russia by Menschnikov and Vinogradsky, Poland by Beni, Bujvid, and Golazovsky, Sweden and Norway by Jardal, Mam, Lindstrom, Nordenson, Selander, Switzerland by Seronville, Depin, Ladam, Sore, Tarel, Sulzer. The leading scientific societies also had their delegates. The University of Athens was represented by M. Panas and the Berlin Society of Medicine and Faculty of Medicine by M. Bouchard. There were still other delegations from the Society of Medicine at Bern, the Belgian Society of Microscopy, and the Society of Students of the Civil Hospitals of Brussels, from the Academic College of Bucharest and the University of Christiania, from the Association of Hygiene at Cologne, from the Academy of Copenhagen, etc. The French delegations were called forward in their turn, and those from Dole and Arcbois attracted special attention because in the midst of this glorious ceremony they called to mind the humble origin of Pasteur. The mayor of Dole offered him in the name of its citizens an album containing reproductions of his birth certificate and of the little house in which he was born. This was an intimate note, tender and touching. Pasteur's reply to these discourses celebrating his glory had to be read by his son. It is a page of grave eloquence and forms, as it were, his moral and scientific testament. Here is the complete text, which deserves to be preserved as one of the most beautiful monuments of French thought. Monsieur, the President of the Republic, your presence transforms everything. An intimate festival becomes a great festival, and the simple anniversary of the birth of a scientist will remain, thanks to you, a date in the history of French science. Monsieur the Minister, gentlemen, in the midst of all this brilliance, my first thought reverts regretfully to all those men of science who spent their lives in vain endeavors. In the past, they had to struggle against prejudices which stifled their ideas. These prejudices conquered, they still encountered other obstacles and difficulties of all sorts. It was only a few years ago before the public authorities and the municipal council had begun to provide magnificent abodes for science, that a man whom I greatly loved and admired, Claude Bernard, possessed as his sole laboratory a low and humid cellar only a few steps from here. Perhaps it was in that cellar that he contracted the disease which caused his death. Upon learning of the reception you were preparing for me tonight, 
his was the first image that rose before my mind i salute the memory of that great man gentlemen though an ingenious and delicate thought it would seem as though you had wished to cause a vision of my entire life to pass before my eyes one of my compatriots from the jura the mayor of the city of dole has brought me a photograph of the very humble home in which my father and mother lived their hard and needy life the presence of all these students from the ecole normale reminds me of the intoxication of my first scientific enthusiasms the representatives of the faculty of lille evoke the memory of my first studies in crystallography and fermentations which opened to me an entire new world what boundless hopes took possession of me when i first grasped the fact that there were laws behind all those obscure phenomena you my dear colleagues have yourselves been witnesses of the series of deductions that permitted me as a disciple of the experimental method to arrive at physiological studies if at times i have troubled the calm of your academies with somewhat heated discussions it was because i was passionately defending the truth you lastly delegates from foreign nations who have come from so far to give proof of your sympathy toward france you bring me the most profound joy that can be felt by a man who believes invincibly that science and peace will triumph over ignorance and war that the various peoples will come to an agreement not to destroy but to build up and that the future will belong to those who have done the most for suffering humanity i appeal to you my dear lister and to you all illustrious representatives of science and medicine and surgery young men young men put your confidence in these sure and powerful methods from which we have as yet learned only the first secrets and i say to all of you whatever your career may be guard yourselves from the taint of destructive and sterile scepticism refuse to be discouraged by the sadness of certain hours which pass over a nation live in the serene peace of laboratories and libraries say to yourselves at first what have i done toward my own education and then in proportion as you advance what have i done for my country do so up to the moment when perhaps you may have the immense happiness of thinking that you have contributed in some measure to the progress and well-being of humanity but whether life favors your efforts to a greater or a less extent one must have earned the right to say when the great goal draws near i have done what i could gentlemen i wish to express my profound emotion and my deepest gratitude just as the great artist roti on the reverse side of this medal has hidden under roses the date of heavy years that weigh upon my life so you my dear colleagues have wished to give to my old age a spectacle to gladden it immensely the spectacle of all this eager and affectionate youth the ceremony notwithstanding that it was official ended in an outburst of enthusiasm that gave it a high human significance louis pasteur had fulfilled his task the robust toiler genius and dogged will combined could now rest among his disciples who continued the struggle in his place and according to his methods on behalf of science and against disease in order to extend the frontiers of life End of section 14. Section 15 of Louis Pasteur by Albert Keim and Louis Lumet. Translated by Frederick Tabor Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 11. The Last Days of a Great Man. Ever since his first attacks of paralysis, Pasteur had retained a certain heaviness in his movements, and while his brain was intact, experiments demanding a supreme manual dexterity had become difficult for him he was forced regretfully to abandon his labours still unsatisfied with what he had achieved 
and with his imagination still active and dreaming of discoveries that still evaded him. Pasteur continued to follow the experiments of his disciples, which were born of his methods, but what he wanted was the power to push onward by himself to the extreme limits of the new path which his genius had laid open. However, he accepted his destiny without bitterness. He was able to share the delight of Dr. Roux when the latter's labors resulted in the discovery of a vaccine for diphtheria which had previously decimated the lives of children. Then croup was vanquished, just as rabies and anthrax had been before it. Thousands of existences, and those of the most precious sort, for the future of the race slumbered in them, had thus been saved. Dr. Yersin, for his part, discovered the microbe of the plague. While the whole band of workers who had come to be known as Pasteurians, each following his individual aptitudes and tastes, rivaled one another in zealous service of science and humanity. It was at this period of researches and discoveries based on his doctrines and his processes as an experimenter that Louis Pasteur was attacked by the malady from which he was destined to die. On the 1st of November, 1894, he had an attack of uremia, and there followed a long, slow agony lasting for months with alternations of hope and despair. Pasteur endured it with Christian resignation, for science in his case had in no way destroyed faith, and throughout his life he had remained a practical Catholic. His pupils took turns in watching beside him, thus showing that he had not only been able to arouse their scientific enthusiasm, but had also attached them to him by his kindliness and bigness of heart. At the end of December, writes Monsieur Valéry Radeau, we began to have hope. On the 1st of January, after receiving all of his collaborators down to the youngest of the laboratory attendants, Pasteur saw one of his colleagues of the Académie Française enter the room. It was Alexandre Dumas. He had a bouquet of roses with him and was accompanied by one of his daughters. I wanted to begin the year well, he said. I bring you all my best wishes. Ever since they first met, twelve years before, on a certain Thursday at the Académie Française, Alexandre Dumas and Pasteur had felt themselves mutually drawn toward each other. Pasteur, charmed at first by the swift deductions of his brilliant mind, had been surprised, touched, deeply moved by the courtesies and delicate attentions that were prompted by a heart which opened to friendship all the more widely because it opened only in deep earnest. Dumas, who had a wide experience of men, loved and admired Pasteur as a genius without pride and full of kindliness. On this New Year's afternoon he fell to chatting with a cordiality that contained something of the unquenchable gaiety of his father. In this little chamber adjoining the laboratory, how remote he was from all the worlds that he had studied, the worlds inhabited by the class of beings he had studied, microbes in human form, as he called them, creatures that were either dangerous, ridiculous, or vile. Occasionally, however, he had shown upon the stage man as he might be, and as he ought to be, a Montaigne, a Claude, poor, well-meaning man, out of place in our times. For back of this dramatic author was a man eager to exert a moral influence, back of the realist a symbolist, back of the satirist a mystic. After having hungered for glory, he placed higher than all else the desire to be useful, and the glance of his blue eyes, ordinarily cold and keen, seeming to penetrate one's most secret thoughts, this glance, always on guard, always ironic, took on an expression of affectionate veneration for him whom he called our dear and great pastor. It is only those who are accustomed to tend the sick can know how much pleasure certain visits give them. That of Alexandre Dumas, pasteur compared to a ray of sunshine, vie de pasteur. The illustrious old man still had a few more happy hours before him, but although he was removed to Villeneuve-les-Tangs, 
the change to the country brought no improvement to his condition which had now become hopeless pasteur resigned himself to die and nevertheless he took great care to hide his sufferings in order to spare the feelings of his family and his disciples he was not however always master of his own emotions happening one evening to be alone with his grandchildren the son and daughter of monsieur and madame valerie radot he took them in his arms and kissed them lingeringly while heavy tears rolled slowly down the length of his pain-racked face when the startled children questioned him the great man answered sorrowfully i am weeping my children because i am so soon to leave you it was during the afternoon of wednesday september twenty seventh that the cure of garches was summoned to the side of pasteur whose end was felt to be very near he received extreme unction after having made confession to r p boulanger of the dominican order he died the following morning at twenty minutes to five after a brief agony it was a universal calamity telegrams poured into the institute and there is one of them which must be cited in full and which came from the establishment in berlin directed by dr koch who had so often had occasion to combat him profoundly moved by the loss which is universally felt and which the pasteur institute has just sustained in the person of its gifted founder the berlin institute of infectious diseases expresses its heartfelt participation in the general sorrow the government decided that the obsequies of louis pasteur should be national and that the state should bear the expense they were conducted with full official pomp and before an immense public gathering on october fifth eighteen ninety five the religious ceremony presided over by monseigneur richard was conducted at notre dame in the presence of the president of the republic felix for the grand duke constantine of russia and prince nicholas of greece at its conclusion m poincare delivered an admirable address in the name of the government beside the bier where it rested before the threshold of notre dame science he said will never weary messieurs of admiring in the genius of pasteur the combined force of a creative imagination and the most rigorous experimental method he had sudden inspirations which bore him on toward unexpected discoveries he had instincts of divination which pushed him forward along unexplored paths he had swift headlong rushes of thought that overleaped and anticipated the establishment of the truth prepared the way for it made its attainment more rapid and more sure but when a scientific problem had taken shape before him in one of those general flashes of illumination he never considered it as solved until he had questioned all nature until he had classified or eliminated all of the facts until he had forced them each and every one to give him an answer he was careful to guard against any philosophical prejudice that might hamper the sincerity of his observations the experimental method he declared in his address at the time of his reception at the academie should be detached from all metaphysical speculation and while claiming for his conscience the right to assert loudly its spiritual and religious convictions he claimed no less energetically the prerogatives of liberty on behalf of science and it was really the unrestrained curiosity of his searching mind spurred on by his inventive powers and seconded by his scrupulous research for objective truths that guided him through the long and brilliant evolution of his scientific labors happy is he said pasteur happy is he who carries within him his own ideal and lives in obedience to it throughout his life pasteur himself lived in obedience to the highest and purest of ideals in science and virtue and charity all his thoughts and all his actions were illumined by the reflected rays of that inner flame he owed his greatness to his sensibilities and posterity will assign him a place 
in the radiant line of apostles of goodness and of truth. The body of Louis Pasteur was interred in the Institute, and there he lies in the cold and austere crypt, while men of learning, inspired by his genius, continue and carry toward completion his work that was so prolific for the advance of science and for the good of humanity. The illustrious savant was one of the greatest of modern heroes, and we may well conclude with the words of Émile Duclos, there is no other example in science of a savant who has been privileged to see the domain which he discovered expand and bear fruit to such an extent. Perhaps Lavoisier, whose name comes naturally to mind in speaking of Pasteur, might have had the joy of seeing himself equally great if he had been able to keep on to the end of his career. The only exact comparison is that of a Napoleon dying triumphant in the midst of Europe, permanently conquered and pacified. Even that vision, magnificent as it is, is incomplete. Pasteur conquered the world, yet his glory did not cost a single tear. End. End of section 15. Recording by Pamela Nagami in Encino, California. February 2017. End of Louis Pasteur by Albert Keim and Louis Lumet, translated by Frederick Tabor Cooper.